Hello, everyone, as you're joining, we'll get started in just a minute. Okay, well, it looks like a couple of folks are still rolling on, um, but I can go ahead and get started with our intro slides. So, um, hello, uh, welcome to the third and final installment of the Building Envelope campaign webinar series. Um, in this series, we are sharing technical assistance and recognition opportunities uh, through three of DOE's technology campaigns, um, the Building Envelope campaign, the Integrated Lighting campaign, and the Storm Window and Insulating Panel campaign. Um, it highlights free engagement and recognition opportunities and features campaign participants uh, sharing practical approaches to improving energy efficiency. So before we dive in, there are a few housekeeping points that I would like to cover. Uh, please note that today's webinar will be recorded and archived on the Better Building Solutions Center. Uh, we will follow up with you when today's recording and slides are made available. And next, the attendees are in listen-only mode, uh, which means your microphones are muted. Um, if you experience any audio or visual issues throughout the webinar, uh, please send a message in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom panel. Um, so my name is, uh, is Haley McLeod. I am the campaign lead for the Building Envelope campaign. I work at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab located in East Tennessee. Um, and as I was saying, today you'll hear from multiple DOE technology campaigns. Um, you'll hear about from me about the building envelope campaign, then the integrated lighting campaign and the storm window and insulating panel campaign. Um, and then we'll end with some technical viewpoints um, on the integration of these campaigns into historic buildings. And then we'll close out with a Q&A session. So if you do have questions that pop up um, over the webinar, please drop them in the chat. Um, if you want to advance to the next slide, I will go ahead and jump in. I'm still seeing the intro slide. Perfect. Okay. Um, so like I said, I'm Haley McLeod. I'm the lead for the Building Envelope campaign. And so the first thing that I like to start my webinars out by doing is by saying thank you to the organizers for the Building Envelope campaign. Um, in addition to the support we get from uh, DOE and Better Buildings, um, I work with uh, these three organizations as my, my brain trust, as my organizers. So that's the American Institute of Architects, the International Facility Management Association, and the International Institute of Building and Closure Consultants, or AIA, IFMA, and IVEC. Um, and we meet monthly, and they give me tons of really important feedback on the campaign. So I'd just like to start by saying thank you to them. Next slide, please. So the Building Envelope campaign was really born out of a question, which is how to assess the overall building envelope performance without accounting for how the building is used. Uh, next slide, please. So I am not an architect or engineer, so uh, this is as technical as any of my slide deck gets, but basically um, the building envelope performance metric was developed um, to be sort of the basis of the building envelope campaign. Um, we also introduced a new free assessment tool to determine your building envelope performance value. And basically, this is a, a new metric, but it's in the same units as EUI. So it is something that you're probably familiar with. Uh, while EUI is spread across the conditioned floor area of a building, um, the BEP value is spread across the envelope area um, of a building. Next slide. So, um, so that was the basis of the envelope campaign, but what is the envelope campaign? Um, we are one of the current uh, DOE and Better Buildings technology campaigns. You're gonna hear from others today, but that's not even all of them. There are more. Um, and basically all of us are trying to create more energy efficient buildings in the building stock in the US, uh, but the building envelope campaign specifically has introduced this new metric and assessment tool um, to aid in that effort. Next slide. So our goals are to motivate action and increase awareness around these high performing building envelopes. We want to uh, recognize leaders um, who, you know, have amazing buildings that have these high-performing building envelopes, 
And then we uh, wanted to uh, demonstrate and document the energy and cost savings that can be achieved um, through high performing building envelope systems. Uh, next slide. So other than our organizers, we kind of have two main lanes of engagement with the campaign. Uh, we have our supporters and we have our participants. So our supporters are uh, going to be those folks that have a vested interest in the campaign in high performing building envelopes. Uh, those tend to be manufacturers, industry organizations, um, consulting firms, that kind of thing. You have full access to the campaign as a supporter. Um, but it just means that you probably don't have a building to enter into the assessment tool and to determine the BEP value of. Uh, whereas our participants are going to be owners, operators, uh, consultants on buildings that they actually want to enter into the assessment tool. Next slide. So like I said, there are, um, this is a, you know, a free campaign to, uh, to participate in, but there are, um, you know, this is a recognition effort. And so we have um, some, I'm going to go through our recognition tiers and categories here. Um, the campaign is open to new construction and retrofit buildings. Obviously, I wouldn't be here talking to you about historic buildings if retrofit uh, wasn't an available category. And um, that is commercial buildings and multifamily residential buildings. So basically, that excludes single family residential, um, but everything else is basically fair game. For our uh, retrofit recognition, um, we would like to see either 30 or 50% improvement. Those are our two tiers. And that's the difference between your, um, the, the existing building and then the as retrofit building. So we're looking for a 30 or 50% improvement in the building envelope performance as determined by our assessment tool. Uh, for new construction, we're looking for a 20 or 40% improvement. The reason those numbers are a little bit lower is because we're looking for improvement over code, which we think is a little bit harder to achieve. So that's why those numbers are a little lower. Now, on top of either a novel or retro award, um, you can get a role model award. And so last year, we only had one type of role model. Uh, this year, we actually have two types of role model awards. Uh, we have a technology role model award. So if you're uh, implementing something really great that we would like to recognize in the industry, uh, we can uh, give you a technology role model award. And then we have an equity role model award, which is new this year and that I'm really excited about. Um, and we're actually asking projects to self-identify for this award. And so if you think your building type, building location, project team, um, community served by your building um, qualifies you for this award, uh, we just asked for a little narrative about it. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to be incorporating this award in the campaign this year. Um, our last recognition tier that is available is an honorable mention. So if you don't quite hit that retro 30 or novel 20 threshold, um, we may still want to acknowledge your impact on the campaign and may give you an honorable mention. Uh, next slide. So uh, the timeline of our campaign, uh, we're closing out our second year. We launched in June of 2020 at the Better Building Summit. We're always open for new participants and supporters to sign up. Um, we are currently actively um, accepting and reviewing submittals from our participants. Um, our original spring submittal deadline was this Friday the 8th, but we actually just announced today that we are extending that until Friday, April 22nd. Um, so you have a little over two weeks still to submit a building um, for this year, and that is more than enough time to do it. Our tool is not super complicated. So um, I, I definitely think if I said, have said something that you're interested in, you can definitely still get a building in for this year. Um, and then we'll host a summer or fall recognition event. Uh, this campaign is free and obligation free to join, and it's easy to switch from a supporter to a participant. So if you're interested, I encourage you to go ahead and sign up. Next slide. Um, I do wanna talk about uh, what we achieved in our first year. Uh, 16 buildings were submitted for recognition um, and 14 were actually eligible. One of those was a historic building that I'll talk more about in just a minute. Um, but these 14 buildings covered almost uh, one and a half million square feet of conditioned floor area and 9 million KBTU annual savings were realized based on envelope technologies alone. Um, and as the campaign lead, the thing that was most exciting to me about sort of our, our grad, her year one graduating class um, was that these were a really diverse group of buildings. They were new construction and retrofit. They were from across the country and all these different climate zones and representing all these different sectors. And so it was really great because um, I just feel like, you know, envelope improvements are for everyone. Next slide. 
So we did have a bias for new construction projects in our first year, um, but interestingly, I'm seeing more uh, more retrofit projects in, uh, come through in the year two submittals so far. So that's been interesting to see. Uh, next slide. So these were our retrofit projects that we recognized last year, um, including uh, building 246, which is the historic building that I am going to discuss. Uh, next slide. So building 246, um, I thought was um, a really neat building. Um, I'm going to talk about it at a very high level. Um, EYP was the, the firm that submitted this project. Um, I do have a longer video uh, that they recorded up on the Building Envelope Campaign website um, that provides uh, more information. So you're welcome to put questions about this building in the chat, but I may not be able to answer them. I may have to refer you out um, to the project team on this one. Um, this building was originally constructed um, in the late 1800s. It's located in Virginia. And it is home to the Regimental Orientation Program for the 3rd U.S. Infantry Regiment, uh, otherwise known as the Old Guard. And it is the Army's uh, oldest active duty infantry unit. And it's actually the unit um, that does the, like, is assigned to the ceremonial stuff surrounding, like, the President and the White House. Um, so no big deal. Um, and this envelope was modernized to outperform current energy code while leaving the historic fabric of the envelope untouched. So I'm going to talk about it in a little bit more detail, but basically they left the exterior alone and all of the envelope improvements were done on the interior of this building um, to keep the facade as is basically. Um, and it was a very cool project. Next slide. So I know this is a wall of text, but basically the uh, existing historic windows were backed with new windows, um, with new double-paned insulated windows. So again, that kept the, the window facade basically as it was, and that um, improved the performance of the window assembly by 40% beyond code requirements. And then those exterior walls were left alone, but the interior of the exterior walls um, were renovated with R22 continuous insulation. Um, that linked into those new window assemblies. So you have continuous insulation along the whole inside of the building, and that achieved a 50% improvement beyond code requirements. And then the roof was also modernized. I don't know if you noticed in that photo, but it's this really dark gray slate roof, you know, not necessarily ideal. Um, and so continuous insulation was added on the inside of that roof, um, and some um, an airspace was added for some um, additional ventilation. Uh, which improved comfort in those occupied attic spaces. So like I said, there is a longer, still only like five minutes, but there is a longer, more detailed video from the project team on building 246 um, on the Envelope Campaign website that I encourage you to check out because um, this is a really neat building and your, um, you know, your retrofit envelope, uh, um, you know, efforts are, um, are definitely something that could be recognized through the Building Envelope Campaign. So with that, uh, if I could see the next slide, please. I am going to pass it over to Allegra Steenson from Pacific Northwest National Lab. So take it away, Allegra. Hi, everybody. My name is Allegra Steenson, and I'm a research scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Lab. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the integrated lighting campaign and um, a campaign that I'm working on, the storm windows and insulating panels campaign. Go to the next slide. Um, the integrated lighting campaign um, is a campaign run through PNNL. I don't personally work on it, but I am going to be presenting these slides um, on behalf of my colleague, Axel Pearson. Next slide. Um, just like the name sounds, the integrated lighting campaign focuses on recognizing integrated lighting projects, which means that the lighting system can communicate with other building systems to enhance building performance. Integrating the lighting system with other building systems can achieve deeper whole building energy savings. For example, by exchanging information with HVAC systems or controllable plug loads or supporting the internet of things. But that's not all this campaign is interested in. There are still luminaires and luminaire control systems that the team is hoping to capture as well. Advanced systems and controls in lighting that improve lighting performance are of interest and the ILC would love to hear how systems are going above and beyond simple occupancy, daylighting, and scheduling approaches. Through the ILC, we hope to learn about and recognize some of these innovative lighting projects as well as supporters of these projects. Next. Um, submissions for recognition are now open and will close on April 15th, so if you're aware of a project that would be interested in getting recognized, you can visit the integrated lighting campaign.energy.gov 
or you can email the campaign organizers for more information. Axel Pearson at the Pacific Northwest National Lab would be happy to discuss, or you can send a general inquiry to integratedlighting at pnnl.gov. Next. Next, I would like to tell you about the Storm Window and Insulating Panel, or SWIP, campaign. The SWIP campaign is a collaborative initiative sponsored by the Department of Energy and managed by the Pacific Northwest National Lab to accelerate the adoption of low E storm windows and insulated panels, delivering energy savings and comfort in residential and commercial buildings at a fraction of the cost of full window replacements. Inefficient windows waste energy and cost millions of dollars every year in heating and cooling, and the goal of the SWIP campaign is to leave no poor performing window uncovered. Next, please. The SWIP campaign aims to increase awareness, visibility, and build the body of knowledge about low E storm windows. When people think of storm windows, what comes to mind are old, unattractive storms that need to be removed and put up again seasonally, but these monitored units are not your grandma's storm windows. The campaign also acts as a national platform for collecting and sharing information and best practices related to storm windows. We work with utilities and energy efficiency programs to justify, launch, and promote new storm window programs. One aspect of this work includes modeling state-specific energy savings associated with low east storm windows for submission to state technical reference documents. The SWIP campaign serves as a one-stop shop for resources and technical assistance to help overcome barriers to adoption. And we also work with weatherization agencies to provide support to increase the adoption of low east storm windows into their programs. The campaign also provides national recognition for organizations that have demonstrated success in their adoption or promotion of this technology. And we provide assistance and work closely with utilities and agencies that want to pilot low east storm windows. We are currently looking to start a new pilot program. So please do not hesitate to reach out if you are interested in learning more or um, participating in a pilot. Next, please. Um, if you are interested in adopting or implementing low E storm windows, the SWIP campaign is here to help. By joining the campaign, participants can stay up to date with the latest campaign news in the form of our campaign newsletter, learn about best practices for including low E storm windows in your program, connect with low E storm window manufacturers, receive technical assistance, and receive national recognition for demonstrating success in adopting or promoting low E storm windows and insulating panels. Together, we can leave no poor performing window behind. <laughs> if you want to learn more or are interested in participating in a pilot program, you can visit the SWIP campaign webpage, uh, contact us through our Tech Challenge email. You can reach out to me or my um, colleague and campaign lead, Christian Valoria. And with that, I'll hand it off to Tom, um, who's going to tell you a little bit about how these windows work. Okay. All right. Thanks, Allegra. Um, so yeah, I'm Tom Culp. I'm a outside consultant, but I do a lot of work with the uh, Allegra and the rest of the team at PNNL on this particular campaign, and have been involved in some of the research on these products from the early days, in the last 20 years or so, which we'll talk about. All right. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll be talking as about insulated panels and low-e storm windows to cost-effectively retrofit existing windows. We've done a similar talk last month on multifamily, but today we'll be focusing on historic applications. So I'll be talking about some of the products and the technology and then giving a bunch of examples, talking through uh, some historic buildings and some of the uh, real life examples and, and issues and, and solutions that uh, the various um, product manufacturers have dealt with. Uh, next slide, please. So before we get into the specific technology, I kind of want to just outline the overall opportunity in a broad sense, um, especially on, in our case, the window retrofit side. So we all work on new big building technology. We talk about new building codes, yet that overlooks the vast amount of energy that's uh, used or wasted in existing buildings. And if we look at the kind of the market, so to speak, uh, DOE and PNNL have done studies looking at on the residential side, there's about 19 billion square feet of existing windows and 40% of those still have single glazing and a similar amount have double pane clear, meaning um, they don't have uh, low E glass or what we would consider a modern energy efficient new window. So there's a big opportunity there on the residential side. 
And then on the commercial side, it's uh, similar where there's about 2 billion square feet of single glazing still out there in commercial buildings. And it's changing very slowly. Uh, less than half a percent of the glazing area is addressed each year, whether it's the replacement or, or uh, some of the technologies we'll be talking about today. So that's what we're trying to do is it, how do we accelerate this and address the, uh, the problem and the opportunity on the existing building side. So next slide, please. So, you know, as I mentioned, there's a great new window technology, great glazing technology out there. We don't want to take anything away from that. Um, but there are situations uh, that come up. Number one, what if uh, rip out and replacement of an existing window is impractical? You're in a tall building or, uh, or cost prohibitive. Uh, what if it's not allowed or you don't want to replace existing windows? As in today's case, we're talking about historic buildings um, where you, uh, we have to deal with the historic aspect. So next slide. So one solution, they go by many names and we'll, we'll talk about some of those, but uh, our modern low east storm windows, there's insulating panels, there's commercial secondary glazing. They're all different terms, but uh, it's the same idea that you're basically uh, taking or adding an additional glazing layer or multiple layers onto an existing window. Um, so that you're uh, without replacing the existing window. So you're basically upgrading the window, upgrading the performance of the existing window. And the cost of this can be a quarter or a third of the cost of full window replacement, yet you're going to get similar energy savings as full window replacement. And we try to encourage people to think of this as an insulation measure. You're insulating your windows. Um, and it's also an air sealing measure, which we'll talk about. There's significant benefits on both sides. Uh, there's many options out there, different materials, um, product options, dealing with low E glass, films, thin glass, panels, and we'll show examples of each of those today. But as Allegra mentioned earlier, you know, uh, sometimes you see the word storm window, that's, um, there's other terms, so we like to use both, but uh, these are not your old storm windows. These are not your grandmother's storm windows. Um, these are modern uh, new products, they're designed to be aesthetically pleasing. We'll talk about some of the appearance issues and custom colors and things like that that are necessary on the historic side. They're uh, you know, made to be, they're a permanent installation, yet they can also be removed when necessary as is required sometimes for uh, uh, historic attributes. But the point is they're not going up and down seasonally like uh, some of those old 1950s things. They can be operable or fixed. They can be on the interior and the exterior. And then in addition to the thermal performance benefit, um, we see other benefits such as improved comfort, improved acoustics, uh, and reduced air leakage. And we'll talk a, a little bit about that. Uh, next slide, please. So these are just again some real world examples because sometimes people have heard about these uh, in terms of uh, low income weatherization. And that is a very important um, application for low east storm windows. And we have other presentations and, and talk about that application. It's a very important application, but it's not just that. You know, you can see these are all real world examples using uh, secondary glazing or insulating panels or uh, um, low east storm windows on regular homes, historic homes, historic buildings, um, uh, light commercial buildings, even high rise buildings. So we'll talk about some of these cases in the coming slides. Uh, next. So um, I'll mention, and we'll see there's, there are different options out there in terms of materials and products. So, uh, um, but one we did want to talk about is low E glass. Um, so you probably have hopefully heard about low E glass or low E windows, but what is that? So low E glass is a, incorporates a low emissivity coating, which is a transparent microscopic coating on the glass. It's a window after all, you have to be able to see through it but it re reflects the infrared heat back into the home. So by cutting that radiative heat loss and reflecting that heat back in the home, you're reducing your building energy usage. And in terms of the window, you're getting a lower U factor or a higher R value in terms of insulating properties. Uh, next slide. So, and this is uh, a good example. It's easy to see. You can do an IR field image. Um, this is an image taken from the exterior of a home of uh, three windows that are all single pane. Uh, in this case, light colors show heat loss. 
and the middle one is the original single pane window. And then on the left and right are uh, two windows that have been addressed with low E storm windows. And you can see the heat loss is dramatically reduced by adding this secondary layer with a, a low E coating. Uh, next slide, please. So now how much the improvement, uh, how much the window is improved depends upon the existing window type underneath. So you have to kind of look at the exact details, but in a general sense, um, with a um, low E uh, glass, when you add that type of product over a single pane window, you'll see U factor decrease by about 60% with a low E panel. Now I keep saying low E, but there are other options out there. Um, for instance, there are acrylic panels and thin glass with, uh, without low E or can be combined with low E. So there's different options out there and they each have their advantages. And, and, uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, for instance, on the acrylic panels, they can be a uh, custom fit to get a very airtight um, fit into the building and provide insulating airtight and acoustic benefits. And we'll show examples of both. Here, we're talking about the low E in particular though. Over double pane windows, using a low E panel, um, the U factor was decreased by 43 to 57%. The solar heat gain is also reduced uh, um, with this, as you add this uh, glazing layer, about 20%. And then if you're in a location that um, has a mixed kind of climate, both heating and cooling demands, uh, you can, there are options to do a solar control low E glass that uh, um, will reduce your solar heat gain even more. Um, and then you can take the next step, which is you can now, there are options out there, products out there with uh, using, where you add two layers, a dual pane secondary window. And the, the example shown on the screen uses a thin glass pan, uh, piece along with a, a, another piece, a low E glass, so that you can, in, in a lightweight manner, basically take that single pane window all the way up to the performance of a triple pane. So there's a lot of options out there. Um, and, I'll, and we're going to go through some specific products and, and uh, uh, project examples here in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit on the history before we get into more historic, although these are older buildings. Um, DOE has funded a lot of work over the years. Uh, so uh, first off with some uh, kind of um, weatherization type homes in the Chicago area and then later in the Atlanta area. Um, where we you know, retrofit these with uh, low E storm windows in these cases, and we saw a heating reduction in the heating loads of 20% roughly. Um, in Atlanta, where it's a mixed climate, we also saw cooling savings, although it varied a lot depending on the specific home, how much it was shaded by trees and, and issues like that. And then the other thing we wanted to point out is the air leakage benefit. Um, we did nothing else in these homes, no air sealing, nothing else. But the only thing we did was add a low E storm window over the single pane. And by doing this, when you did a blower door test, you saw a reduction in the overall home air leakage by six to eight percent in the first case, up to 17 percent in the Atlanta studies. It depends a lot on the home. But the point is, you know, these existing buildings, the existing windows can be quite leaky adding a low E insulating panel, low E storm window, the different options out there can have a dramatic improvement. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, similarly, we did a, a study in Philadelphia, uh, multifamily to large apartment buildings where um, they had old uh, clear glass storm windows that really were not doing much. And so those were replaced with modern low E storm windows. Uh, we saw a 20% reduction in heating, 9% reduction in cooling. And again, same thing, by only doing the windows and nothing else, we, just by doing that, we saw a 10% reduction in the apartment air leakage, which is quite significant for energy savings as well as comfort, as well as acoustic uh, benefits. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, PNNL has a set of homes. They're, uh, they're lab homes that are uh, they're, they're exact matches um, designed to represent older homes and they're highly instrumented. So you can do side-by-side -side testing of different technologies across the board. For this uh, particular set of tests, they took, uh, uh, they had double pane clear glass aluminum windows. So kind of representative older windows and then added uh, low E storm windows and low E storm doors over that. And they saw 10% annual energy savings reduction from using the, uh, the low E storm windows. And interestingly, that compared to a 12% reduction for triple pane replacement windows but at much more uh, uh, affordable standpoint. So it shows you are getting similar energy savings, but at faster payback period, much more cost-effective in five to seven year time frame. Next slide. 
And then on the weatherization side, we're going to be talking about historic here in a, in a bit, but weatherization is an important aspect. And, and uh, for those states that use, uh, we use some of the software that's used by many states for weatherization qualifications across uh, the entire country, all eight climate zones, and uh, looking at the savings to investment ratio or SIR, and you have to be greater than one to qualify for weatherization programs. And it was found to be cost effective uh, with very good SIR numbers in climate zones three through eight, where uh, so basically the south central all the way up north uh, when installed over single pane windows and double pane metal frame windows. So uh, next slide. Okay, so now let's get a little bit more into the historic applications. And so um, I'm going to go through a bunch of examples with different types of approaches and, and uh, uh, technologies. Um, and I'll talk about exterior and interior and different materials and product choices that are out there uh, to try and give you a sense of what others are doing and what you might do in your projects. Um, first off, though, you know, this is uh, I'll talk about interior versus exterior, because uh, we know that uh, there's a lot of discussion or debate amongst the historic community about what you should use. Some feel very strongly that you should use exterior products because then you are protecting the primary the historic window underneath from the elements. On the other hand, others are uh, very passionate that it should be an interior solution so that you're not affecting the outside appearance at all. Um, so we understand there's both kind of out, both opinions out there. The good news is there are products and solutions for both out there as well. Um, and we also know the number one rule is you need to match appearance, you know, historic, you need to make sure it fits into the historic, um, attributes of the facade minimizing any impact on the on the existing facade or the appearance uh you know like a like a toupee you you don't want to see it you would only see the bad ones so uh um the idea is you know matching sight lines matching custom colors things like that and so so we'll go through that and you'll see that in a bunch of these examples so first up there's two here using exterior low e panels these are uh first one is from phoenixville uh, library in uh, Pennsylvania. This is a 1901 Andrew, Andrew Carnegie building. Um, in this case, they chose to use exterior low E panels. There's a range of products from small to very large arch top windows in there. Um, and then you, they used a custom color match to, and uh, matching pro, uh, sight lines to, uh, to minimize the appearance on that particular building. The next one below is uh, Newcomer Hall in Maryland at the Maryland School for the Blind in Baltimore. Um, this was interesting in that they had uh, the architect wanted to use uh, certain replacement windows and the Maryland Historic Trust said no, they did not would not approve those particular windows uh, because they would not fit in and it was considered too much of an alteration for this historic building. And so the solution was an ex exterior low E operable storm windows that matched the sight lines. Um, and then again, had a custom color match. Uh, and then in this case, because it's a mixed climate with both heating and cooling, they used uh, solar control glass to give a little more solar control as well. Next slide, please. Uh, one more example on the, ex on the exterior. So this is an exterior Lowy panel at, uh, interestingly, at the US Naval Academy, Halligan Hall, 1903 building, um, where the Navy had very, uh, particular historic uh, requirements uh, in terms of appearance and, and functionality. And so this, in this case, they required exterior operable low E panels. And then they had to do a custom color match to Navy, the new, kind of this unique Navy seafoam green that they're famous for. So it was a very old building with uh, interesting application um, of operable exterior panels that uh, fit into this very historic building. Uh, next slide, please. So I gave some ex exterior examples, but to be honest, I, the most of what we've seen has really been on the interior. So we want to talk about some of the different options here on the interior. Uh, and the, this first uh, type of uh, uh, application uses interior thin glass panels. So this is a uh, Hill Brothers Coffee Building in San Francisco, California, um, where they have used a thin glass product that goes on the inside, so you're not affecting the exterior of the building at all. But even so, even though it's on the interior, you have to still match sight lines. So they came up with a custom frame design to match the sight lines and custom color uh, in this case. 
and they're using um, this particular case they're using a thin glass which uh, with a solar control film laminated onto it so it's a lightweight for these larger windows um, to fit in and, and like we we're talking about um, the uh, appearance the picture on the right shows one retrofit and one not and I could not tell you which one is which I'd have to ask the people who submitted the win the photos but um, that's the whole point um, so that's a great example next next slide please so again some more examples using these interior thin glass panels Cadillac place in Detroit Michigan 100 year old former GM headquarters uh, this was they wanted to address the thermal performance of this uh, you know old building with a, a, a tremendous number of single windows very key so they installed them during 16 minutes to start when unfortunately this little thing called COVID hit so they haven't haven't been able to go back yet but at some point they hopefully will um, but to address for thermal performance but along with that. We also saw a very good air leakage and acoustic benefits from doing that. And we hope to see that whole building uh, addressed here in the future. Another example down below, again, using these interior thin glass panels and just, uh, I guess, point to that photo on the right there that shows uh, when a person carrying one of these large thin glass windows, which makes the point of uh, one advantage of that technology is the lightweight application for, uh, for installation. Uh, next. Uh, switching to another option there are the interior acrylic panels I alluded to earlier. So now these don't have the low E coating on them. So the U factor won't be uh, quite as low, but they are um, have other uh, benefits to them in that they can be custom fit very accurately for very tight air leakage uh, fit into the opening. And so uh, as a result, and the reduced air leakage uh, in your energy use, has uh, significant improvements of thermal comfort and acoustic soundproofing. Um, so this is a building, an adaptive reuse building, um, where they wanted to have done from the inside, where they want to maintain the historic exterior. Plus, it's a lot easier to do on a high rise from the interior with any of these products, um, without having to use cranes or window washing platforms and so forth. Um, and so this was in New York City. Uh, next slide. Here's a few more examples using the same interior acrylic panels. Um, one's a hotel in Virginia. The other one is the Oregon Historical Society building in Portland, Oregon. And the thing I wanted to point out here is that in both these cases, they approach these projects with other attributes in mind. So in the hotel, they wanted to approach this as part of a soundproofing project. In the lower example, it's a, you know, they wanted, they were looking for something with UV block, blocking properties to help protect museum library collection. Uh, but when you get one of these benefits, you get them all. So for all these products, when you, uh, you know, they all come together, it's a great solution because you're going to get not only the reduced energy use, you're going to get the improved thermal comfort, the improved acoustics, um, and other attributes, like in the case of the UV blocking options for this, this, uh, um, this particular museum. Uh, so they can all come along for the ride if you, uh, you know, look at your needs, which is, which is part of the point. It's great. Uh, next slide, please. And then one more example on the interior. So uh, in addition to the thin glass and the acrylic, these are a couple examples using interior low E glass panels. Uh, the top one is Carnegie Hall. And I always kind of chuckle when I see this one because it's okay, it's not that one. It's the other one in Lewisburg, Virginia. I was surprised to learn that Carnegie apparently did a whole bunch of Carnegie Halls across the, the US as you know, over his career. So um, this is one is in Virginia, 1902 historic landmark. Uh, in this case, he used an interior low E over single pane, double hung windows, some very large up to four by 11 feet. So, uh, you know, that's um, the, you know, windows of all sizes, shapes um, uh, can be addressed by these different technologies. Uh, next one, Umbrella Works. It's an old umbrella factory, as you might guess, from the late 1800s in uh, Pennsylvania, an adaptive reuse to apartments. So uh, they are making significant changes in the building, but maintaining the, the architect is sensitive to maintaining that historic envelope. So these were done with uh, interior low E glass panels. Similarly, the one, the, the one on the lower right, an even older uh, residence, 1867, that was later converted to a, a, a Waldorf school. 
not wanting to uh, change any of the ex exterior appearance, or um, so they used a interior Lowy glass panel. Next slide. So last thing, thing I'd like to touch on is really um, the uh, existing building standards. I hope you've seen this. I hope you're aware of it because it's a new phenomenon where uh, local at the local action, um, you know, particularly at the city level, they're trying to address climate change by addressing existing buildings, realizing that's where a lot of the energy use and carbon use is. And so it started off with energy disclosure laws that a number of large cities have for larger buildings above a certain side, larger commercial buildings usually, they have to report their energy use every year. The next step are these building performance standards, which then uh, set a limit, an energy use or an emission limit on existing buildings. And if you're um, over that limit, you have to do something. You have to, uh, to upgrade the performance of your building. And these building performance standards have been enacted in a number of cities that you see there. Probably most people are familiar with New York City, Local Law 97, but it's, it's around the country, all this, St. Louis, uh, Boston, Washington State, District of Columbia, Colorado. Um, and it, so it creates a large incentive to upgrade existing buildings, including the envelope and windows. So uh, we should really be targeting on these particular locations and we will be seeing increased demand to address both existing and, I mean, both historic and non-historic existing buildings. Uh, next slide. And this is a, uh, a slide that shows a map. Um, every dot on there, every location on there has signed on to the National Building Performance Standard Coalition and committed to passing one of these policies in the next couple of years. So we will see this coming across the country. And if you look at those locations, uh, especially in the Northeast, but really a lot of these places, um, there are going to be historic building, uh, um, you know, needs in those locations. Now, some of these policies will exempt historic buildings, others will not. So you will have to look and see what each city does. But the point is, it's a key opportunity for the use of some of these insulated panels, low use storm windows, commercial secondary glazing to cost effectively upgrade your existing buildings, including historic. Uh, next slide. And just to wrap up here, um, so where do you find more product information? Um, EPA has a new Energy Star program for exterior and interior storm windows. You can find uh, product listings and information there on their website. There's also the Attachment Energy Rating Council or AERC. They have a new certification program, both for storm windows on the residential side, as well as commercial secondary windows, which are some of the, the products we've been seeing here today on the commercial side. And there's a lot of overlap where you can use them, um, you know, depending on the scenario in each, in each area, but there's more information on the performance of these products at, at their website as well. And I, last slide, I believe. Last slide. Yep, there we go. Yeah, so just uh, more information um, that you can uh, contact um, uh, anyone on the PNNL team. So Allegra, uh, Christian Valoria, Catherine Court, Katie Court, or myself. Um, and then thank you to the, uh, the companies that provided the photos and participated in all the projects that you saw here today. Um, and I think that's it. So I think we're ready to move on to questions. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Allegra and Tom, for all of that um, detailed information. And we definitely had uh, some questions come in, um, so I will I will moderate them as best I can. Um, I definitely think some some folks have some questions for you, Tom. Um, unfortunately, the first question is for me, and I do not know the answer to it. Uh, the first question is that for Building Two Four Six, what is the code for well insulation in Virginia? And unfortunately, I do not know that off the top of my head. Um, apologies. That's just you know that was. Not my, not my project. I'm sure the project team knows. Um, but uh, next question, um, which is I think sort of a question and a comment for all of us says that the, uh, the Seattle Landmark Committee puts landmark preservationist decisions in direct conflict with our energy codes. Uh, what about working with landmark organizations to educate and convince, or, and convince members of the importance of energy and for energy efficiency measures, excuse me, <laughs> tripping over myself. Um, our board often disallows window replacement, and we are left with trying to make our envelope work with leaky original single pane windows. 
Um, so I think, you know, you, you talked to, you talked a lot about, yeah. um, you know, about some of that, Tom, do you have, well, yeah, and I, I'd like I mean, to add I, I think that. that one, yeah, I was going to say, I think that one came, uh, at the 320, so it was definitely as you were still right. going, but yeah, go ahead. So go part ahead. of the, part of the point of today's presentation is to show those options without window replacement of how do you address those single pane windows, but the question about the energy code, this is allowed by the energy code. The energy code, whether it's ASHRAE 90.1, the International Energy Conservation Code, or then the state codes, specifically allow you to put on a, um, a storm window insulating panel, secondary glazing, because you're improving what's already there. So the, uh, if you choose this approach, then it's not in conflict um, with the energy code. Um, it, I will point out, though, that if it's in a hazardous location, you still have to make sure it's safety glazing, uh, tempered glass, uh, if you happen to be. But beyond that, go for it. You should be doing this. And I, I don't think there is a conflict with the energy code. All right. Thank you. Um, next up, uh, several references have been made to products that are out there for various applications. How do potential facility applications learn how to reach these solution providers. So are there any great resources that you can recommend? Well, when you get a copy of the slides, there were, uh, <laughs> you know, they pointed to the EPA um, Energy Star uh, website. There are specific product manufacturers and, and products listed there. Same thing for the Attachment Energy Rating Council, AERC. Uh, there are specific products and, uh, um, and listed there. And then for the companies that provided photos for today, their, their uh, credit is given to them as well on the, on the slides. So um, you can look into each of those companies, uh, at least on the, on the glazing side of things. All right, um, and you continue to be very popular. So uh, Tom, do <laughs> window mullions typically have to be matched or can a picture window style picture window style storm window be placed interior or exterior to a window with millions? So as always, the, the ultimate decision is up to your local historic preservation board or uh, whoever's making that decision. Sometimes it could just be the, an architect that, you know, that, that they may have the final say, but typically, and there are a number of photos, it is generally okay to put kind of a picture window or you know, a, a full glazing panel over a window that has uh, mullions. Um, they want the frame profiles and sight lines to match up usually, like for the, you know, like a meeting rail and a double hung or things like that. But if it's a true divided light with all those little mullions, most cases we've not seen the historic board force you to match up all the, the individual mullions. Um, that can be done, but much more difficult and probably a lot more expensive. All right, great. Um, and then I think you you actually answered, or you mentioned this in one of your other answers to your questions, but there was a question about whether the large interior interior glass panels that you showed in some of your slides were safety glass. And it sounds like in, in some cases, depending on the location they are. Right, so the building, the building code defines what is a hazardous location, but it'll tend to be larger lights, especially ones closer to the ground or nearer a door or walk-in surface. But the bottom line is that if, uh, um, if safety glazing is required, there are, there are products out there that, that can meet that either as a laminate or as tempered glass. Um, uh, some of the thin glass options can't be tempered, but there's uh, safety films that can be put onto the thin glass. So there are options out there to address that when, uh, when, when, that, when needed. But... Excellent. Um, and then there's a note here that Seattle should be on your list. <laughs> so... Oh, for the, maybe um, for the building performance standards. So probably, yeah, they have one actually. They, there's a little different than the others, but they, they do have a, the state of Washington has one for the entire state and then Seattle has their own thing plus a incentive program as well. So they're trying both the carrot and the stick approach, which is nice to hear. So there are opportunities in Seattle for upgrading existing buildings as well. Thank you. Um, and then I saw that Allegra had a question that she uh, answered in the chat, but I'm just going to read it out um, and read your response just to make sure everybody saw it, um, which is, uh, you know, something that we've been talking about, which is, you know, are the storm windows allowed in historic buildings? And it is really um, jurisdiction depends uh, jurisdiction to ju ju jurisdiction. But as we've been discussing, many allow storm windows and there are a lot of options um, that hopefully you can 
ring to your local historic buildings and say, you know, one way or another, we're going to improve the windows on this building. And I have 40 options for you now, but we're going to do it. Um, and, so if it hope- <laughs> and if it helps, call it an insulated panel instead of a storm window. Same there thing. You go. <laughs> yes, terminology is important, as we yeah. all know. Um, Okay, well, those are all the questions that have come into the chat so far. So if any of our uh, participants have any additional questions, I'll give you another second to drop those in. Um, And if not, we do just have a couple more um, housekeeping slides to close this out and make you aware of the rest of the stuff that's coming up uh, via Better Buildings. So seeing seeing no more questions come in, um, we can move on to the next slide. I hope. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much for uh, for joining our webinar today. Um, if you'd like to watch either of the previous installments in this series, um, which again, we're about schools and about uh, multifamily buildings. Um, if you head over to the Better Building Solutions Center on demand webinar page, you can find recordings of those um, and, and even more webinars. Uh, next slide. The um, 2020, uh, the Better Building Summit is coming, or the Better Buildings, Better Plants Summit is coming up. Um, it will take place in person May 17th through 19th um, in Crystal City, Virginia, so right in the DC area. Uh, this event will feature engaging and interactive sessions, as well as opportunities for attendees to network with their fellow, fellow industry peers and experts. Um, and registration is open now, um, so please head on over, visit the Better Building Solutions Center uh, to learn more and register. Uh, next slide. And with that, I would like to again say thank you to our panelists, Allegra and Tom, uh, for taking the time to be with us today. Um, please feel free to contact any of us with additional questions. Um, and thank you so much. We look forward to hearing from you.